this lesson, we'll learn how to begin acquiring data on a specific condition, um, such as a trigger, and we'll learn how to use a harbor source as this trigger. We'll start this lesson by describing what a trigger is and how it's implemented. So why would we even use triggering? Um, the first most obvious case is that we really want to only collect data um, when a certain um, event is happening or a certain natural phenomenon is happening. So you can imagine that if we just collected, let's say we're waiting for a lightning strike, right? So if I just sit there and collect all of the data and log all the data coming in while I wait for this lightning strike, I'm going to use up a bunch of hardware resources, my file size is going to be gigantic, um, I'll be using all this processing power, all when really only I need to collect data when that lightning strike happens. So if we could somehow trigger off of that lightning strike, we could collect only the data we need, we'd then prevent buffer overflow, the file size would be much smaller, and um, another benefit of triggering is that we can synchronize two tasks together using a single trigger. Almost every data acquisition or generation task will follow the same basic procedure. Um, so we have the start task, we acquire generate data in the while loop, and then we stop the task. One thing to realize is that uh, we've actually been using triggers this whole time, um, and it's been done under the hood and we just haven't realized it. So even just by using the start task, we're implicitly specifying a trigger um, that gets configured as, let's say, device one AI start trigger. Um, and this just depends on internal hardware clocks and it's used even if we don't specify a start trigger, uh, hence the name implicit trigger. So if we actually do want to specify a trigger, we can use the DACMX trigger.vi um, and then we can say, hey, look here for my trigger. It can be a digital trigger or analog trigger. And this start task VI just gets the task ready to measure or generate, and we'll just sit there and wait for the trigger um, to happen. So when we do want to implement a trigger in Dacamix, we use the trigger VI. Um, so you can choose the start trigger, reference trigger, analog, digital, and whatnot. And then you can also choose these options with a uh, Dacamix trigger property node. We've seen this same slide before um, in one of our previous lessons. And the key question here is that with this block diagram, um, are we guaranteed to start measurements or generations at the same time? And the answer is no. So even though we're using the same sample clock, um, the separation between the exact start times of the two tasks will still depend on a software time delay. Uh, between these two uh, start task VIs. Um, and this time delay comes from variations due to the operating system clock. So what we really need to do is specify start triggers so that we can synchronize these two tasks. In this section, we'll discuss the different types of hardware triggers. In this demonstration, I'm just going to go through our uh, 9178 specifications to highlight the uh, triggering options that we have. One key thing to note is that not all hardware supports triggering. So make sure you check out the manuals to see um, if the specific type of triggering that you're looking to do is supported. And I would highly recommend uh, that if you And then we have some analog input functions. We can use analog input for start triggers, reference triggers, pause triggers, as a sample clock, and then as a sample clock time base. Uh, output functions we can also use for start trigger, pause trigger, sample clock, um, and the sample clock time base. And then we can use um, counter timer functions as a gate, a source, hardware arming, auxiliary, 
So we go here, explains what a trigger signal is and the three triggers that we have available. We have the start trigger, reference trigger, Be sure to check out your hardware manual to see exactly what trigger. There are three types of trigger actions. Uh, one is the start trigger. So this would obviously be, oh, once I receive the trigger, I'm going to start collecting data. The next is a reference trigger. Uh, so this would actually be uh, using a circular buffer. Um, you're always collecting data, but you're not actually sending any to the application until you receive a trigger. So I'm collecting data in my circular buffer then I trigger, I'm going to collect some data before the trigger and some data after the trigger. So you have data pre-trigger and data post-trigger. Then we have the pause trigger. So you'll be collecting data, you can pause the collection of the data and then start it up again on a second trigger. We'll go over these in a little bit more detail in the next few slides and you'll get So we would use a start trigger when we want to use the trigger to let us know when to start acquiring data. Um, a typical use case for this is actually, let's say I have a camera recording some footage, um, but I really just want to record the footage when my experiment's actually running, um, and I also only want to collect data when my experiment's actually running. So what you can do is, um, sometimes have a camera set up to produce a start trigger and then you would only start collecting data when the camera is started so that, they, so that way they're synchronized and you only collect the data uh, that you need while the video is recording So the reference trigger is the one that uses a uh, circular buffer scheme and then um, so you're constantly collecting data in the circular buffer, replacing the oldest points with the newest samples and then once the trigger is received, a specified number of points before and after the trigger are returned to, to the calling application which would be uh, LabVIEW or C or whatever you're using. And so you, so you can see this uh, in the block diagram by the pre-trigger samples and that is where you'll provide the number of samples that you want to take before and after the trigger is received. Um, if you don't provide anything or if you provide zero then it's just a post-trigger acquisition. A good example of using this might be um, let's say I want to actually record data for a lightning strike. You know I want to get some data that happens right before the lightning strike, maybe magnetic fields or something, and then data afterwards. So the circular buffer would collecting data, you somehow trigger off a lightning strike, and then you have data before and after the event. In this example of a pause trigger, uh, the internal sample clock is gated by the trigger source. Um, so when the signal is high, we'll pause. But when the signal is low, we'll resume collecting data. An example of using this would be, I only want to collect data uh, on my device when it's you know, functioning at ex extreme limits. Um, so if the signal is above a certain level, it'll start collecting data, but if not, it won't. Um, and you can configure the pause trigger to um, start collecting data if it's high or low, uh, so you can do it both ways. This trigger can also use an analog or digital signal as its source. It's also possible to use uh, multiple triggers. So in this case, we're actually using a just a start digital edge trigger to start our acquisition, but we're also combining that with a um, reference trigger. So the start trigger will kind of start the whole system, then I'll be collecting data in my circular buffer until I get the reference trigger and I'll have the pre-trigger samples and post-trigger samples. In this section, we'll take a look at the sources that we can use as triggers. So the possible sources for uh, digital triggers can be PFI lines, PXI trigger lines, and RITC trigger lines. 
Uh, this image here is from a peak side chassis and kind of demonstrates what options we have. Um, the peak side star line is actually a high performance trigger signal that we can use to synchronize all the modules in the peak side chassis. Um, and this uh, offers increased performance, so it has a propagation delay of no more than five nanoseconds. So if you really need that, you might want to look into a peak side chassis. And again, PFI lines are just programmable function interface lines. Um, so we can use them in a variety of different ways. Also remember that uh, not all hardware supports triggering, so be sure to check out the manual before you uh, purchase or decide to use anything. Remember that you can use a digital or analog source as your trigger. So when you're using digital, it's usually just a TTL signal, and um, a certain edge initiates the acquisition. When you're using an analog signal, uh, the level of the voltage coming in and the slope of the analog signal uh, can initiate acquisition. The different trigger sources are as follows, so a digital edge, um, which I think is the most typical type of trigger used. Uh, the little arrow on these charts is where the actual uh, trigger happens. And so with the digital edge, if it's rising or falling, we trigger our acquisition or generation. Um, this is pretty easy to implement, and again, is one of the most uh, popular methods for triggering. We then have digital patterns, so if we get a combination, of zeros and ones, we can trigger off of that. Um, analog edge is simply um, once your analog signal reaches a certain level, we'll trigger right after that. You can also have hysteresis so that if it goes back and forth a lot or there's a lot of noise, you can try to mitigate that and choose a correct uh, triggering spot. So with the um, analog window option, we basically just specify when, when the task um, will start or stop when it enters a certain window. So you'd specify um, the top of that window and the bottom of that window, and then whether to uh, start acquiring or stop acquiring when it enters or leaves. So we have a, a ton of options for triggering. In this exercise, we'll um, have a VI that generates a tone, and then we'll have to figure out how to only generate that tone when we uh, press a trigger in the Dacamex demo box. This is exercise 7-1 solution walkthrough. So, we uh, started with the tone generation VI, and I've just opened up the solution so we can walk through it. As you can see, we've got um, one specific function that produces the, um, the tone that we want to make, which is just the um, generated sine waves. So these are the frequencies and the amplitudes, and then we feed that into our DACMX right VI. And so what module are we going to use? Well, there are only a couple models that are connected to the um, speaker anyways, and so that's the 9263 module. So that's in slot four, and we're just going to be using analog output zero. So we'll be using an analog output voltage task. And we're not continuously generating a tone, so this is just a finite um, generation. And how long will the tone last? Well, we can see here that this is just the rate of samples we want, and so this is samples per second, and then this is how many sam finite samples that we want to produce, and they're exactly the same, so the tone will only last for one second. So we have the uh, DACMX write VI before the start task VI, uh, because for buffered write operations, we have to make sure that the buffer uh, has data to write before the task actually starts. And then in addition to that, we want to make sure that the uh, specified operation is done right before the whole task is completed. So we use uh, this wait until task done VI. We then added the digital trigger here with the, um, the triggering VI. 
So now the task will wait until we get a signal from our trigger on the uh, demo box. And this is going to be start digital edge. We can point it to the PFI zero line, which is on the CDAC chassis. So we've made sure that all of the functions are correct and ready to go. So I can start this. And as you see, nothing has happened. We haven't gotten a tone yet. But once I go over here and press the trigger, I'll get a tone. So there it went. And that was the walkthrough for exercise 7-1. In this exercise, you modified a tone generation VI by adding a hardware trigger so that the tone occurs only after you push the trigger button on the CDAC demo box. The trigger button on the demo box. We've reached the end of this lesson, so we're going to do a quick review with a quiz. Every acquisition starts with the trigger, true or false. The answer is true. So name three ways to implement a start trigger. Match the type of trigger to its timing diagram. In this lesson, we talked about triggering, uh, so we did a quick overview of triggers.